My name is Damien Collodi, and I'm an American filmmaker. In the summer of 2004, I documented protests to both the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. At the Democratic Convention in Boston, demonstrators were corralled into a free speech cage. At the Republican Convention in New York City, thousands of nonviolent protesters filled the streets daily despite a vast and intimidating police presence. Police made sweeping arrests, and there seemed to be a blatant disregard for First Amendment rights. When the 2004 U.S. presidential election was finally decided, I was disappointed to say the least. I had been hoping for change. Now, I just wanted to escape, even leave the country. I thought of Ukraine. They were having a presidential election of their own, and I was hoping for a real revolution. You know, when the masses rise up and demand change, no matter what the cost. I wanted to believe in the power of the people again, the kind of passion you have when you've got nothing to lose. Ukraine was not a totally random choice. You see, my dad was born there. His parents had emigrated to New York City in 1949, my mother's in 1946. My parents met in the 60s in the East Village, Manhattan's Ukrainian neighborhood. They had much in common. Both were teachers and also children of Ukrainian political refugees. They married, and in 1977, I was born. My little brother and I grew up steeped in the traditions of Ukraina, the motherland. We went to Ukrainian school and spoke only Ukrainian at home. So I asked around and found out through some friends of mine that there was a need for election monitors. I applied online and was accepted. I quickly bought a ticket, found my passport, and got my visa. I packed up some clothes on my camera, and within a week, I was set to board a plane to Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine. Viktor Yanukovych was President Kuchma's hand-picked successor. He was the current Prime Minister of Ukraine and former governor of the eastern region of Donetsk. He had also spent time in jail for rape and was accused of having mafia ties. Due to his position in the government, Yanukovych had power over information, access to the nation's budget, and the backing of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Not surprisingly, Yanukovych's popularity was mainly in the Russian-speaking regions of eastern and southern Ukraine. In contrast, Viktor Yushchenko, the former head of the Ukrainian National Bank and former prime minister of Ukraine, leaned toward European and Western ideals. His rhetoric drew thousands of supporters, often dressed in orange, his political campaign color. His popularity grew quickly as his progressive platform brought hope of change to the country. Yushchenko's popularity grew stronger, and he proved a very real threat to the Kuchma government. Until one evening in early September 2004, when a dinner with Secret Service agents almost ended it all. Suddenly, Yushchenko fell deathly ill. He was flown to a specialized hospital in Vienna. The cause of his mysterious illness was determined to be dioxin, a deadly chemical which he had somehow ingested the night of the dinner. The dioxin should have killed him. It didn't, but it left the handsome Yushchenko permanently disfigured. With the new election some days away, I decided it was time to talk to the people and see what they had to say. The young people of Ukraine were against Yanukovych, not for Yushchenko, but against Yanukovych. For we want to be a European country, we want to be a democratic country, uh, we want uh, to live in market economy and not in the uh, Soviet Union Republic. We supported the democracy in Ukraine. Yeah. We don't want the man that who, who was two times in prison, who can't speak Ukrainian, who is supported by criminals. We don't want him in, in the power. I saw some small demonstrations by Pora, which is a nonpartisan organization dedicated to ensuring the voting process is conducted fairly. I was surprised to see such an active participation and mobilization of youth. 
Panam is it's time. Like ti time is now. It's include people, young people who want, who understand that now it's time to change something and to do something. Our main aim is to uh, preserve the legitimacy of the electoral process and to uh, protect the fair elections, the fair choice of the voters. So we want that that person who was really elected by the people to be a president of our country. The more volatile places are further east and south, where there is a lot more falsification and corruption and intimidation going on. But if I go out there, um, there's a chance that I may not be able to make it back here to Kiev should anything happen. After voting the 21st of November, come here, there will be see the beginning of the movement for the democracy, or they will see the victory of democracy by voting. The snow would be heavy tonight. Would the weather prevent people from going to the polls? People expected the elections to be corrupt. Many believed the Kuchma regime would do anything it could to stay in power. The youth were motivated, expecting the worst and prepared for a fight. But would that be enough? The question that remained was, what will the people do if the election is stolen? The evening before elections, Independence Square, or Maidan, as it's known in Ukrainian, was eerily quiet. I decided to monitor the elections in Kiev. I traveled from station to station, observing and documenting the voting procedure. The first problem was the delayed opening of the polls and restless crowds of voters. It was much more chaotic than our own election process. While approximately 60% of the population came out to vote in the American election, 77% of Ukrainians showed up at the polls, a huge turnout. The Central Election Commission announced that Yanukovych was leading by 3%. However, exit polls varied greatly. Falsification accounts came pouring in from all across the country. There were buses that carried people from one polling station to another, allowing them to vote multiple times. Ballot boxes were being stuffed. Some people were unable to find their name on voter registration forms. And there were more graphic accounts of aggression. Intimidation of both Yushchenko supporters and campaign workers was both rampant and blatant. And now, back at the Central Election Commission, Yushchenko was being denied access to the building. I went to the Central Election Commission myself to see if I could get inside. Surprisingly, my election monitor certification allowed me access into the very building Yushchenko was being denied entry to. I arrived just in time to catch a media announcement from Yulia Timoshenko, one of Yushchenko's most visible supporters. Viktor Andreevich Yushchenko, with great pride, 
те, що відбувається в останні години в ЦДК і в східних областях України, називається масовою потужною класифікацією важкого руху. Я зараз від всієї нашої команди звертаюся до вас, щоб завтра о 9-й годині рано на площі Незалежності зібралося як наймога більше людей. Я знаю, що у вас є робота, є свої власні справи, але захистити своє життя і Україну – це якраз прийшов час. I was awestruck by the thousands of people who had gathered on Maidan that morning. I felt a sense of history, a continuation of my grandparents' struggle. Unlike the complacent response I saw in America, these people had risked their jobs. They had much to lose. Somehow they knew that by not heeding Eula's call to gather, there was a greater price to be paid. An energy of unity radiated from the crowd, but I wondered how would they channel that power? Я знаю, що моя країна сьогодні переживає надзвичайно складні часи. Я знаю, що сьогодні твориться велике зло у моїй країні для того, щоб продовжити панування злочинців. Тому що я знаю, що сьогодні всі від дітей до дорослих, від офіцерів і політиків до вчителів і лікарів мусять стати на захист України. Я хочу запитати у вас, чи зможемо ми з вами утримати перемогу? Я знаю, що це так. І я знаю, що перший раз за 13 років ми не підемо з Києва без влади. Це так? As evening came, there was no sign that people were ready to go home. Ми виступаємо за нову владу, яку має прийти в Україну. Ми проти фальсифікації, які зробила наша нова, стара, нова, тире, стара влада. Дай Боже Україні нового майбутнього, дай Боже Україні нового президента. Слава Україні! Президента Ющенка! Найостанні ще новини дуже цікаві. Це те, що відбулося у Львові, Тернополі та Івано-Франковську, що вони оголосили своїм офіційним єдиним президентом України Віктору Ющенка і відмовилися виконувати будь-які накази іншої влади. Це революція вже. Має Київ піднятися, і він вже піднявся. Слава Богу, Київ піднявся, і в кожній області мусимо виганяти ту нечисть з як адміністрації, і піде по всій Україні, і вниз. І тільки тоді, коли влада відчує, що коріння порване, вона тут попросту, я думаю, замре. The next day, the movement continued to grow. Hundreds of thousands were now flooding the Maidan, despite freezing temperatures. I was stunned by the sheer number of people and frustrated that I couldn't capture it all in my camera frame. 
через годину почне засідання Верховної Ради. Давайте домовимося, ми будемо працювати як народні депутати Верховної Ради. Моє прохання, щоб ви відповідно працювали на вулиці. Я переконаний, що наші спільні зусилля приведуть сьогодні нас до політичного успіху. Тому хай Бог нам допомагає і прошу мирно, організовано, починаємо ходу до Верховної Ради України. Слава Україні! These were leaders who led by example, who not only talked the talk, but literally walked the walk. The march to Parliament asserted the power of the masses. The Ukrainian government could not ignore the chanting outside as decisions were being made inside. No, we came to show to show our central committee який під неправильно підрахував наші голоси. Ми прийшли сюди, тому що ми не можемо відкорити з тої несправедливості, що вони з нами роблять, це є страшне. І якщо вже народ з тих регіонів України голосує так, то влада має обрати також так. Чому це не відбувається, не знаю. Я вже нарешті люди пробудилися. Україна стала з колін. Вже неможливо терпіти та їм брехні і знущання з людей. Мені все одно, я вже прожила життя, мені все одно, але заради своїх дітей, онуків, я прийшла сюди. І не піду звідти, поки ніщо не зміниться, поки не зміниться влада. Не піду. На сарматер їх. Ющенко supporters continued to chant for hours. Then, in an emergency meeting inside parliament, Viktor Yushchenko stepped up to the podium and took the presidential oath of office. Though it was a symbolic gesture, it proved to be extremely powerful. I can't believe how many people are here. It's just, you just don't see an end to the people. It's just a sea of people anywhere you look. It's really amazing. Uh, we were uh, one million, more than one million people were uh, near the parliament there. What we have shown today is that we are not going to leave this place until we win. Because uh, mafia, uh, we, with, uh, well, the former government have uh, falsified uh, elections and everyone understands this. I'm really tired. I haven't gotten that much sleep. After almost three continuous days of filming outdoors, I was utterly exhausted. I needed sleep, but I just couldn't allow myself to put the camera down. At the presidential administration, new arrivals from Western Ukraine began to set up yet another tent city. The government quickly responded by sending troops. As I ran after them, I wondered whether they would use force against the people.
after Yulia spoke with the militia, surprisingly, they allowed her through into the administration. We were left wondering what to do next. Over the past few days and nights, the Yushchenko chant had become so much more than just the name of a presidential candidate. It was a cry for peace, for freedom, for justice, and for truth. It had come to symbolize a history of suffering and intolerance that was finally being expressed. And it would become a word that carried hope around the world. But as uplifting as hope may be, people still had to survive in freezing weather and take care of their physical needs, sleeping, eating, and staying warm. Ну що, ми з Києва. Тут працюємо, працюємо в ресторані. Кожного дня ми готуємо гарячу їду на Майдан. По 3-4 рази на день ми приїжджаємо безкоштовно так і будемо готувати скільки, скільки потрібно буде. A week earlier, I had attended a rave party at the Expo Center. Now the space was being used as a shelter for newly arrived revolutionaries. Підтримка сюда і, скажімо, приїхала зразу ж велика кількість людей в Київ звернулися до того, щоб людей розмістити. Люди взяли на квартири, на квартири не могли розміщати великі групи, почали звертатися організації. Ми відповідно перший день прийняли десь порядка 50 чоловік, але люди приїжджали, приїжджали, ми розвернули потім около 300 на другий день. Потім 800, потім 1300. Вчора у нас було вже 2 Trucks arrived with army boots to be distributed to those in need, myself included. З усієї України я приношу сюди речі, щоб допомагати. То є, а це є власне тепло речі, які потрібні цим людям. Ми цілі служби, які носять чисті носки, теплі носки. І власне люди, яким потрібна якась допомога і теплі речі, вони можуть прийти сюди і просто вибрати якісь ковдри, які їм потрібні. Ви заболіли? Прошу. Вам дати конфету від кашля. Знаєш? <laughs> Це будуть якісь акції, чи може якісь танки прийдуть, я не знаю, може більше людей прийдуть. Якраз тепер чашку сказати, але може тепер будемо щось чути більше від світу, від Європи, від Америки. I heard that a large number of Yanukovych supporters had gathered outside the Central Election Commission to await the results. 
I wanted to hear their perspective. There was a different demeanor about these people. They were just as passionate, but... Вообще ни один президент себе не позволял. Такого, такой манипуляции общественным мнением, причем на сплошной. На сплошной. A winner had been declared. The Central Election Commission announced that Viktor Yanukovych was indeed the official winner of the presidential election. Yushchenko's team had submitted thousands of examples of evidence of election falsification to the Ukrainian Supreme Court. Kiev became a sea of blue and orange. People from both sides kept arriving. Emotions ran high. Real violence never broke out. In fact, the opposite often happened. Although there were many plans, all Yushchenko supporters agreed on one thing. The elections had been falsified, and that was unacceptable. But the days weren't easy. Every person who came out to Maidan knew that just by being there, they were endangering their health and possibly even their lives. There were constant rumors of military movement. 
Even talk of Russian troops in Kiev, disguised as guards in the last rows at the administration. These foreign soldiers would not see Ukrainians as their brothers, and the people knew it. The threat of violence hovered. On Saturday, the infamous seventh day, military tension culminated in a direct threat of attack. Rumors flew. The military was coming to remove the people. Trucks waiting on the outskirts were given the command to move on the city. Rather than flee, the people dug in. They began to build makeshift barriers. And we heard word that even taxis had lined up to block the road. It was scary, not knowing what was happening or when. People stayed awake and alert all through the night. When morning came, surprisingly, Tent City was still there. The command had been retracted, a violent evening prevented. During these long days of protest, Yushchenko, Kuchma, and Yanukovych, under the watch of European leaders, had been meeting to negotiate a resolution to the election conflict. On December 3, 2004, the Ukrainian Supreme Court, believed by many to be on the government's payroll, announced its verdict. Postanovo Centralnej Vyborčej Komisiji, 24. listopada 2004 roku, nr. 1265, pro preludenje rezultati vyboru prezidenta Ukrajine, skasovali. As I watched this well-deserved celebration, I couldn't help but wonder what would have happened in America if the people took to the streets and demanded a full recount or even a revo. Perhaps there are lessons to be learned from these people who challenged 300 years of oppression simply because they decided the time had come. The Supreme Court decided that another election was in order, eventually to be scheduled for December 26. This was a major victory for Yushchenko's team. However, there were compromises to be made. The Constitution was amended so that in a year's time, some of the new president's powers would be transferred to the parliament and the prime minister. This was discouraging to many of the people. I had been in Kiev for close to a month and decided I needed to get out of my comfortable orange bubble and head to Donetsk, Yanukovych's home city, to try to get a sense of the feeling in other parts of the country. When I couldn't find anyone to travel with, I decided to accompany the Pará organized train of friendship. It was a caravan of 50 cars and around 200 people that would journey to censored regions of Ukraine to disseminate information about what was happening in Kiev. This included musicians and performers to attract people and help recreate the atmosphere of Maidan. A road crew traveled ahead of us to erect a stage in the next city. Our goal was to provide people with the truth as we knew it. The friendship train caravan was all over the news, so over 300 people blocked the road to prevent us from entering into Odessa. Sorry. 
Why is this policeman letting them walk the road? Eventually, the military came and forced the crowd apart, allowing us to continue on into the city. The next day, we had our first full-scale musical event in Odessa. It seemed like the undercover supporters thought we would come into town with guns drawn, bloodthirsty fascists determined to force them to change their minds. Instead, they found Ukrainians like them, who desired a better life for their families and their country. In our next stop, the city of Kherson, we had a very mixed reaction. So they are only against Yushchenko. So they don't know why they are for Yanukovych. They think that uh, when Yushchenko will come, uh, he'll support uh, he'll support America, but not Russia. And they want uh, to be uh, with Putin, with Mr. Putin, to be yeah, to be Russian people. They think that uh, there is uh, something like paradise in Russia. I think that now we have to support our Ukrainian culture. So we have to support our Ukrainian language, our traditions, but not Russian traditions. The issue was not always about Ukraine and Russia. America was also a sensitive topic. Сколько каждый день людей гибнет в Ираке? Сколько? Что вам там надо было? Нефть? Да вас будут, блядь, подрывать, будут во всем мире будут рвать и убивать вас. Я не так был загнал. Нет, мировое а сообщество. Он загнал. Вот это вот там в другом месте я, блядь, точно тебе горло перерезал. Честное слово. Да перестань. The misinformation here was frightening, and I realized that this divide was even worse than I thought. Resistance to any new ideas was so strong, I really started to believe that this information war could turn into a civil war. It was finally time to head to Donetsk, Yanukovych's home turf. It was our biggest challenge yet. Many were having second thoughts. The danger factor had risen for me, and I had to decide whether it was worth the risk. You become famous. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> no, I, don't I said that they are being attacked by, by, by Americans in our car. <laughs> so thank you for securing us. Uh... I don't know if I'm going to stay. <laughs> My fellow passengers were not from Ukraine, and after last night's warning, I was quite nervous. I just walked around to see if maybe I can switch cars, because I honestly don't feel that safe in that car, uh, that they don't really understand the situation. Um, there doesn't seem to be any room anywhere else, so I don't think I have much of a choice. Так. Добре. Це добре. Зразу на телефоні. Ти зразу дзвониш Ані. Да. У випадку чого зразу дзвони Ані. А, а Наталь, ви зразу дзвоните мені. Добре? Добре. Все. Все буде добре. Я. Before a bus that's most important. We heard on the radio that effigies of Yula and Victor were being burned in downtown Donetsk. Not a good sign. On the city outskirts, our caravan was blocked entry yet again.
things turn uglier than usual. They're barefooting the stones. Where? Very careful, they throw nails everywhere. They throw nails, be careful, we just blow up two tires. There was real danger now, as hundreds of aggressive Yanukovych supporters converged on us. Silver, relax, dude. No, it's okay. There's a place where you can't go because people are so aggressive. Yeah. We diverted onto the road to the city of Kharkiv. Журналісти наші, українські, розстрілили Україну, наш дом, розумієш? Як? Заплатили, заплатили, вони казали неправду певній когорті людей. Це розділило нашу країну, навкло. Це погано, це так не смішно. Україна, східноєвропейська держава. Today was Christmas in America, but not in Ukraine. That would be next month. Tomorrow would be the anticipated repeat election and the presidency of Ukraine was at stake. Falsification was still a major concern. In the past few days, many people of Ukrainian heritage who had been demonstrating in their home countries had now come to Ukraine to be international election monitors. I was given the choice to observe anywhere in Ukraine. I chose to return to Donetsk. In less than 10 hours after arriving in Kiev, I would be turning around and heading back there. The city had assumed mythic qualities to me. I had heard tales of the clans, gangs, and bandits from the east, and I was hoping to finally see with my own eyes what life there was really like. We'll have them in some oh, of these, yeah. like four. My group was assigned to a small town 40 kilometers outside of the nest. We would split into two teams and try to hit as many polling stations as we could. Not surprisingly, people here were overwhelmingly in favor of Viktor Yanukovych. Altogether, people were very respectful and responsive to us. And in one particular instance, I experienced a surprising reflection and a desire for change. Yeah. 
Що Україні давно нема. Що вона вже Та. розроблена. Та. На все? На одно. Земля ще є. Оце. Оце ще є. Then, late in the day, we received an anonymous call that there were falsifications going on in a polling station in a nearby village. As soon as we arrived, the box had not been sealed. It's gonna, yeah, they're afraid we're gonna just totally knock out their vote. all their votes. That's what they're afraid of. Well, what was up with that, that it wasn't sealed? It wasn't, they're fucking falsifying. It's a no-brainer. There's stuff in the ballots. Mm. They said we get out of Dodge. Before I left Donetsk, I had the chance to meet with Ihor, a local whose brother I'd met in Kiev. It would prove to be one of the most enlightening interviews I did, revealing the Eastern perspective. Але чому вони його так преподнесли? Війна? Так. Ми їдемо, маємо квіти до пам'ятника загиблим шахтарям, хочемо покласти квіти, запалити свічечки, помолитися біля пам'ятника. Потім поїхати на сцені, стати так і так і. Щоб люди побачили, що є такий пояс, дружба. Я думаю, всі, хто там люди є, побачать нас і кожен собі як захоче, так і вже і сприйме, сам розумієш. Ми просто бачимо один в одного людину, бачимо поїзд дружби і їдемо, висловлюємо свою думку. Правильно? Within days, the ballot counting was near completion, and the Central Election Commission announced that Viktor Yushchenko was winning by 8%. Yanukovych supporters continued to contest the results of the revote. Meanwhile, others were already recognizing Viktor Yushchenko as the new president of Ukraine. Finally, on January 20th, 2005, the government papers were finally allowed to publish the official election results declaring Viktor Yushchenko the winner. It was time to say goodbye to Tent City. It had served its purpose, sheltering those who had left their homes in those cold winter weeks to have their voices heard. The Orange Revolution was not a revolution in dictionary terms. There was no violent overthrow of power. It was a revolution of will and resolve that changed a nation. And I believe that it was the people who were truly transformed. They were responsible for a major evolution in Ukrainian society. After so many years of suffering, 
they created a massive uprising without death or violence. The first peaceful revolution in history. Finally, the power of the people had triumphed. It is very important to explain to people like this uh, proverb from the Bible. It's not that uh, the God has to give a person a fish. It has to teach him how to fish. Yeah. And he will be well, fed for a lifetime. Yeah. So this is, this is the problem. That uh, people have to be explained that it is not Yushinko who will take and give them everything. Yeah. It's them who will develop under the new circumstances that will be created. For that each person have the right to, to develop in the way he could and in the way that he has the right to develop. This whole Orange Revolution rocked my perception of the Ukrainian identity. What had always been my grandparents' culture, an old language, an old tradition, suddenly came alive for me. And in the process, had discovered a Ukraine, both past and present. And if anything would remain timeless from this revolution, it would be that Ukrainians had finally become citizens of the world. I know that my grandparents would have been proud. I vowed to return to Ukraine with the finished documentary in hand. I knew even then, running down the streets of Kiev, that one day my film would play a role in educating people about the events that came to be known as the Orange Revolution, one of the most unique and beautiful experiences of my life. Я думаю, вам буде досить цікаво. Я режисер з Нью-Йорку, 
Дякую дуже. Можна я вам потисну руку за те, що ви зробили цей фільм, що ви, власне, вболіваєте за це і що ви вклали в це душу. Це надзвичайно важливо для України. Я продивлюся це. Тут є ваші координати. Я вам дякую. Ми будемо тримати зв'язок. Дякую.